Kia ora, Tato. Hello and uh, welcome everyone to this session of ATEPS 2021, focusing on trade and economic integration in the Asia Pacific. The Asia Pacific is often in the news for being at the nexus of geopolitical tensions. However, it has also been at the frontier of digital trade, innovative trade agreements, and cooperation in the areas of sustainability and the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. So to talk about these issues today, we have two very eminent speakers with us today, Shiro Armstrong and Peter Drisdell. Shiro is an economist and associate professor at the Crawford School of Public Policy. He is director of the Australia-Japan Research Center, editor of the East Asia Forum, director of the East Asian Bureau of Economic Research and Research Associate at the Center of Japanese Economy and Business at the Columbia Business School. Shiro is a visiting scholar at the Research Institute of Economy, Trade and Industry and is a visiting associate professor at Keio University. He is a recipient of the Vice Chancellor Staff Excellence Award for Public Policy and Outreach, and twice the Vice Chancellor's Award for Innovation and Excellence in Service Quality. Our next speaker, Peter, is Emeritus Professor of Economics and the head of the East Asian Bureau of Economic Research and East Asia Forum at Crawford School of Public Policy, the Austra Australian National University. He is widely recognized as the leading intellectual architect of APEC. He is the author of a number of award-winning books and papers on international trade and economic policy in East Asia and the Pacific. To quote the University of New England, from Canberra to Tokyo and Beijing to Delhi, his name is known in the highest echelons of government. For 50 years, he has contributed to some of Australia's most sensitive and enduring economic partnerships in the Asia Pacific, earning him such accolades as Japan's Order of the Rising Sun, the Asia Pacific Prize, the Australian Centenary Medal, and the coveted Weary Dunlop Asia Medal. He's also a member of the Order of Australia. I will now invite both speakers to share their thoughts followed by which I will pose some questions to get a conversation going. So welcome, Shiro and Peter. Thank you for taking the time to join us. And we are very excited to hear from you. Shiro, perhaps we can start with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asha. And thank you for that really kind introduction. Um, look, I'll just very briefly start off by, I think, painting a, a broad picture of, of where we're at. Uh, and that is one of, uh, extreme un uncertainty in the global trading system. Um, we've got a number of big um, challenges that we're facing. Uh, we've got the United States, China, strategic competition, uh, and all the problems that come from that. Um, the narrow po policy choices that many of us have, um, the, the uncertainty as to the rules with both the major powers um, abusing some of the rules, the established rules that we've had, uh, and then, of course, the phase one trade deal that moved the two largest economies and two largest traders away from free trade towards managed trade. So that's a big challenge that we, we're going to face, continuing to face uh, going forward. We also, of course, um, have problems coming out of um, the coronavirus pandemic. One is um, the supply chain problems we're having globally. Uh, some of that early on was due to the lockdowns. Uh, but we have all sorts of flow on effects from, from that um, that we're seeing globally now. So um, they're pretty big problems. Add to that climate change um, and dealing with that and trying to get global cooperation on climate change in this climate when there is already um, big challenges. There are already big challenges with global cooperation. And then, of course, um, protectionism in many of our economies, um, mainly in North America and Europe, but I, I worry that it's going to affect more and more countries as we go forward. And we always do see a lagged effect um, of uh, after big crises and big fractures, protectionism growing after that. Um, and there is some recent research that in fact, the, the last major global pandemic we had during the Spanish flu, uh, tariffs rose faster and higher 
for those countries that experienced more deaths from that pandemic. So if that's any indication of what's to come, we're in for a, a, a tough ride ahead um, for keeping trade open, keeping markets open. So it's in this context where New Zealand hosted a very successful APEC summit um, and a, a successful year, making really big progress, I think, in this part of the world where a lot of these fractures that I mentioned, especially the geopolitical fractures, are, are centre, front and centre. And so it's, it's in forums like APEC that we're going to make progress. And I think we made um, significant progress here uh, through New Zealand's hosting. But of course, um, other forums like the G20 continue to be important. And the G20 comes now to Indonesia in this part of the world for next year. In fact, they've already taken over as president uh, and a very big developing country agenda going forward because we have three G20 hosts in a row that are developing countries. So a host of, of difficult um, issues uh, and we were gonna be looking for leadership from this part of the world, starting from New Zealand, of course, this year, but going forward, um, Indonesia and, and others next year. And it's gonna require a lot of effort by um, the non-major powers, I think, to shape the behavior and the frameworks and the forums for the big major powers uh, to come to more multilateral agreements in character than sort of G2 arrangements that, that risk damaging the system. Uh, but I might just uh, leave it there um, for my initial comments and look forward to the discussion. Thank well, you, Shiro. I just add a bit to what Shiro said, not very much, because he's outlined, I think, the challenges we face, particularly in our region, very clearly. Uh, the intersection between the geopolitical uh, fault lines, uh, the heart of which are in our region, between the United States and China in particular, have, have compromised uh, the multilateral system, which uh, countries like Australia and New Zealand in particular, but all the major economies in our region, even including China, have depended upon. Uh, it's compromised that system. Uh, and there are two big elements really that underlie political and economic security in our region. Uh, um, that they are that multilateral system. Uh, that's a profound and important pillar of economic and political security in our region. And of course, alongside that, the US security framework. Uh, which uh, we rely on and we are close to. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the contest uh, between those two has become stark around the trade war uh, and the broader economic war that's uh, been waged now between the United States and China. So uh, where do we go from here? Um, uh, uh, at a particularly sensitive time, as Shiro said, because we're also trying to manage uh, the recovery from COVID, which in itself induces protectionist pressures that push us backwards uh, out of uh, the commitment to the regime, which is so important to our security and prosperity. Uh, so they're the issues that face us and uh, uh, happy to take your questions on them, Asha. Thank you, Shiro and Peter. Um, so you have uh, both already alluded to the geopolitical fractures. So I might probe that a little further, particularly um, since ATEPS 2020, we now have a new administration in the US. Um, what differences do you see, if any, between the Biden and Trump administrations in their trade policy stance more broadly, and specifically in relation to China? And what do you think the implications are for this region? Well, let me take that one first. I mean, uh, there's no question that the tone of the Biden administration is much more congenial to resolving some of the problems that we have uh, than was the tone of the Trump administration, which uh, disavowed its commitments to multilateral uh, institutions and arrangements, including by bringing uh, the WTO dispute settlement mechanism to its heels uh, and uh, alliance relationships. Uh, uh, like those that underpin our security across the region, but also the European alliance relationship. Uh, and Biden's walked away, taken the United States away from that. But there are still some major problems, uh, and some continuities between uh, uh, the Trump administration and Biden, especially on the trade side, which is important to us. Uh, and in particular, 
the conduct of uh, the trade uh, war with United, with uh, China uh, is uh, looks very much like Trump light, uh, where uh, Biden, the Biden administration, USDR Thai, uh, has returned uh, to the phase one trade deal, which effectively disregards the multilateral rules and does a managed trade deal between the United States and China, which affects third parties, like it affects uh, our access to Chinese markets independently of uh, the contraton we've got into with China uh, over uh, the way in which we've managed our alliance relationship with the United States vis-a-vis -vis China. So um, there are some big problems here uh, that continue under the Biden administration and carry over from the Trump administration. I might just add to that, Asha, that the, the structural domestic issues that brought Trump to power um, you know, the real lack of sharing the benefits from trade and technological change really across American society, the lack of a social safety net um, there, um, like we're used to in Australia and New Zealand, for example, um, those issues haven't been resolved. And that is that is a big focus for President Biden and the trade policy for a middle class. You can see all the the big infrastructure packages and fiscal stimulus that they're, they're pouring out. But, but those structural issues remain. Uh, and so we have seen a continuity really in trade policy, as, as Peter mentioned. It's the doubling down on the, the phase one trade deal with China. It's doing a managed trade deal with the European Union. Now, again, moving US and the European Union away from free trade. And that's really gonna impact our part of the world. Um, it's, it's weakening the already weakened and threatened multilateral system and, and the WTO. And of course, now we're hearing of the United States wanting to do a trade deal with like-minded partners in this part of the world, in the Indo-Pacific, as they call it. Um, and that's a real worry because that will mean that the two large powers are in a managed trade agreement uh, arrangement, while the United States is trying to pick and choose partners to do arrangements with, instead of wrapping um, the Chinese economy in more markets and rules. And I think um, when, as I mentioned earlier, when the two major powers are abusing some of the rules that we're used to, um, unleashing tariffs on, on us, whether it's the United States um, on, with steel and aluminium tariffs, China now with a, a range of tariffs on the Australian, on Australian goods, what protection do smaller countries have? Middle powers, small powers. Um, it is the rules, but it's also um, enmeshing these major powers in open contestable markets. So if there's a retreat from that and the United States doesn't want to engage with the Chinese economy in that way, I think it's, it's a real worry. There'll be big spillovers, negative spillovers for the rest of us. Thanks, Shiro. This resonates with um, a few things I'm hearing from DC, particularly this idea of friend shoring, um, as opposed to offshoring, where the US will pick and choose countries that it wants to engage with. I'm definitely worrying. So um, on a positive note, we are in New Zealand proud of uh, APEC 2021 and what we achieved. Um, and in his address at the APEC leaders and CEO meetings, President Xi Jinping spoke of China's commitment to a free and open Asia Pacific. However, some com commentators are concerned that China with its emphasis on dual circulation is looking inward. And you have both alluded to this um, worry of protectionism, and rising protectionism. Do you share this concern um, about China? And if so, what does that mean for the Asia Pacific? Well, there's no doubt uh, that the uh... Uh, the dual circulation uh, strategy, it's, a, it's a, a strategy of development, uh, is a defensive uh, strategy uh, for, the United, for uh, China against the United States uh, decoupling strategy, both trade and technological decoupling strategy. Uh, and, uh, and it would mean uh, uh, if uh, there was a consistent uh, retreat uh, on the trade front uh, by China, a movement away from deeper engagement in the international economy over time. But it's a, it's a, a strategy that, that's been chosen by China uh, in, the, in the event uh, that uh, it's forced uh, to, to, to stress domestic development over international development. At the same time, 
the Chinese authorities, economic leadership in particular, has made clear that there's no retreat uh, on uh, on trade openness and multilateralism in the rhetoric of things, uh, more so indeed than the United States has. If you like to characterize the United States strategy under Trump uh, and Biden, it's a move from bilateralism, unilateralism to minilateralism, but not a, a, a move back to where we want them to go, which is multilateralism. Uh, and building that is uh, building a strategy to, to achieve that is important both in respect of the United States and and uh, and China. Uh, and as Shiro said, our overriding objective should be to enwrap uh, uh, China in its commitments to the multilateral system uh, through all that we do with China uh, in our broader regional arrangements. The ASEAN arrangement, in a way, was designed to do that. Uh, in uh, China's approach to other arrangements, and of course, particularly within the WTO. So that's that's a major interest uh, for Australia and, and our region. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. And you know, an inward-looking Chinese economy would be a real concern for um, for the rest of us in this region, but also the Chinese economy. Uh, and I think um, you don't have to think too hard about that with most of the world having China as their largest trading partner. Every country in this part of the world, except for a couple, having China as its major trading partner. And that is a dynamic part of the global economy. Um, but I think the Chinese recognize the importance of that and how important it is for them to stay open, as, as Peter said. And I think we can look to, even with things like the dual circulation strategies, look to the Chinese um, putting their hand up to sign up to more rules and enter other agreements like the CPTPP um, and is still uh, a champion of multilateralism despite some of the worries we have and despite some of the transgressions against those rules as we've seen against Australia. So I think it's, it's just important to keep in mind the stake that the Chinese economy has in an open rules-based multilateral trading system Sounds like a lot there, but in, in an open economy, in an open global economy. Um, and they do have a stake in that. And I think the last thing we want to do is collectively push them into a, a domestic retreat away from that. Yes. Um, and uh, so, as you know, China has applied to join the CPTPP and the DEPA agreements. Do you see this as a positive sign for trade in the Asia Pacific region? Very much so, yeah. Look, um, I think it, it should be welcomed. Um, now, there's a lot of difficult and hard negotiation to be done, um, but uh, the accession process for CPTPP, for example, is that every single member, so 11 members, have to agree before a country can join. That means every member has a veto over new members. So it's an opportunity for Australia, for example, to negotiate with the Chinese on getting rid of these trade coercive measures as part of the entry requirements. And I think the first thing to, to, to understand is to, to think that um, the Chinese reform priorities line up quite nicely with the CPTPP standards. Um, that is, if, if we negotiate Chinese entry without exemptions. So it means real disciplines on state-owned enterprises, um, intellectual property protections, although of course China is now a massive producer of intellectual property, um, and maybe we should be trying to get exemptions from um, too high a standard on intellectual property um, protections with China, uh, but around environmental standards, labor standards, all these issues, you know, this is quite closely aligned, I think, now with the, the reform priorities of China, uh, given their stage of development and the problems they're having with state-owned enterprises, for example. So I think it should be seen as a positive, not just for the fact that um, the Chinese are putting their hand up and willing to sign up to new rules and to integrate further into regional and global markets, but also this is a sign that you know, if we get there um, and if the Chinese are genuine and we negotiate their entry in without too many exemptions um, to maintain those high standards, this is going to entrench reforms uh, in the Chinese economy, which is really important. And the deeper agreement, which of course New Zealand's part of, the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, 
Um, although that's not binding, and um, it is a process of cooperation and agreement to principles, and it'll move China a long way forward in making their digital economy more compatible um, with ours, with, with the rest of the region, with Australia's and, and others, uh, for example. So, you know, on net, a very positive. Now, we'll have to see how um, negotiations play out and how genuine they are. Um, but this is, of course, a chance, too, to entice the United States back into regional arrangements like the CPTPP. I, I, this is really an important strategic opportunity, and we should view it as that, that uh, as Shira has outlined, uh, not, not just uh, for the regional agreement itself and uh, strengthening it uh, uh, should uh, China come to the party, uh, but also because, you know, these issues which China would have to negotiate uh, for entry into CPTPP, uh, frontline issues uh, in the reform of the trading system, they're the issues that we've got to talk about in a broader context in, in attending to the gaps there are in the global trading system at the moment and attending to the gaps there are in the trade, global trading system are important to making the WTO effective and work again. So uh, we should welcome this opportunity to work through these issues in the negotiation process uh, that China has sought uh, through accession, seeking accession to the CPTPP. Uh, now that you mentioned the WTO, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on uh, what you think the future of the WTO is. Do we have reasons to be more hopeful or less hopeful now compared to a year ago on the uh, multilateral trading system? Let you go first, Shira. <laughs> Thanks, Asha. Yeah, um, it's hard to tell, isn't it, whether we should be um, more hopeful or less hopeful. I, I think um, we are realizing more and more how important the multilateral trading system is for our prosperity. And if we need any example of that, uh, it's when the pandemic first hit and um, countries started to restrict trade. Uh, and it was really um, restricting exports of food, of personal protective equipment. It was, it was really hoarding um, anything we could and the whole system broke down. And it was amazing how New Zealand signed an agreement with Singapore was a very basic agreement in exchange of food for PPE. And to have to go back to that sort of arrangement, I think was a, a reminder of just how important it is to, to have this multilateral system that really is a scaffolding for all our other agreements, regional and bilateral. Because if that breaks down, um, I think everything else is going to break down. There's you know, these free trade agreements, the bilateral um, regional agreements, uh, do play an important role, but they play a role in enforcing the multilateral um, system. So we get a bit further with the rules in, in these smaller agreements, um, but the, the backstop really uh, is the multilateral system, including the dispute settlement system, which is so important. But we have some dispute settlement systems in other agreements um, outside of the WTO, but they often don't get exercised. They don't get used because they're politicized. So it is important to, to again, resuscitate the di dispute settlement system in the WTO, because that was the crown jewel, um, to get that working in. And then it's a matter of um, updating the rules, because a lot of the rules, as important as they are in, in keeping protectionism at bay, they are out of date. So we don't have rules for digital trade, um, for even services, government procurement, and these are areas, in foreign investment as well, where we're making some progress in plurilateral agreements. Um, so I think we're in a world now where we've been forced to think creatively. You know, the single undertaking in the WTO where everyone, every member has to agree to every aspect of a big trade round um, has meant that we haven't made progress, but we're making progress through plurilateral agreements. Um, we're gonna have to move into a world where uh, just like in APEC, you have Pathfinder um, agreements and Pathfinder uh, initiatives. So I think in that sense, there is a bit of hope. Now, unfortunately, MC12 um, was canceled um, this week in Geneva, but, um, um, I think we have to remain hopeful um, and it'll be up to countries to show leadership um, 
to really put commitments out and, and to show leadership with action. And that's where we're not going to be able to wait for the United States or China, the two large powers, but we will have to do it ourselves um, uh, through coalitions, building coalitions. And this is where Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia, Japan, of course, um, the countries that are going to be very important. What Shiro said, I think, underlines the risks we face uh, because the truth is that the two biggest uh, economic powers have disregarded the WTO and, and that undoubtedly undermines it. So it will be a coalition of the middle powers and those with a big stake in the WTO like we all have in this region uh, that uh, have to attend to these issues and they're not used to doing it. Uh, so we need a new kind of leadership uh, from our leaders in New Zealand and Australia uh, to take these things forward uh, and to make progress in fixing what needs to be fixed in the WTO. We have uh, a surrogate dispute me settlement mechanism that's been uh, put together around uh, the US veto of the system at the moment. Uh, the indications are that, uh, well, at least Thai is coming to the WTO. Uh, her predecessor didn't come to, didn't come to the WTO. Uh, so at least there is an indication that the, uh, the United States is still in the game. Uh, but as I said, it's in the game on terms that are not consistent with multilateralism at the moment. And we have to be very careful of policy snake oil salesmen uh, in this game, uh, because uh, they're purveying, uh, as I said, minilateralist solutions to what are important multilateral problems, multilateral issues. And it's the multilateral system that ultimately provides more security against political coercion uh, than uh, a lot of alliance relationships do. Thanks, Peter and Shiro. I really do share your concern for the multilateral system. I feel like there is a lot of buzz around regional trading agreements, but as we know from standard traditional trade theory, there are issues related to multilateral, um, uh, sorry, regional agreements like trade diversion, the spaghetti bowl of complicated rules. And uh, I fear that we are not paying enough attention to, to boosting the multilateral system. But let's hope that Australia, New Zealand, East Asia, or countries in the Asia Pacific will indeed show some leadership in that area, like you have mentioned. And so I think we will end on a hopeful note, calling upon our leaders to uh, take action. So thank you very thank you. much, um, yeah. Shiro and Peter. We really appreciate your insights, your thoughts, and this has been a fascinating conversation. So thank you both. Thanks very much, Asha. Thank you.